Father's Day. Can we all stand for a moment, okay, just, just for a quickly. One of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he, so he divided his wealth between them, and not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered the estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that land, and he began to impoverish so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to the senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread that I am dying here with hunger? I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt, felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against him and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your sons. But the father said to the slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you for what we already heard. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You are an amazing Father that we could look back to. Lord, we also, Lord, thank you for this time, Lord, this opportunities that you give us. Bless this evening, this morning, Father, as I bring the word, Lord, help your servant. Help us, Lord. Lord, who are we but unto you give us grace to do what we could do, Father. We thank you. Speak to our hearts this morning. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. I remember, I think, 14 years back when I came to church, this was the message that Pastor Carl preached on Luke chapter 15. And uh, when I came to the church, I didn't know what is a spiritual father. And uh, really, we are grateful for Pastor Carl. He showed me what is to be a spiritual father. Can we give him a wonderful hand? And, uh, he's, he's also a great pastor and, uh, and a great friend. And now we could go to him and you know, anytime and we could share the deepest things. I'm really grateful for having him as my pastor. So today is Father's Day. Pastor asked me to share a few minutes on Father's Day message. Am I qualified? I don't know, but my God is qualified. Okay, because remember we shared this Wednesday, Abraham knew he was not perfect, but he knew God was perfect. So that qualifies all of us to talk about fathers today. But uh, before we begin, I was just thinking about a thought, an illustration maybe. I remember buying my new car and, uh, and initially I never drew a car before, but uh, I was riding the car and it was so difficult, oftentimes I didn't know where is what and how to do it. I used to go back to my manual or oftentimes I would take it to the workshop and they would help me how to do it. And, uh, and they helped me and I would be able to drive the car well. In the same way, when I, when, I, when I think about being a father, I could go back to my spiritual father in the Bible and he has a manual for us. There's a great place to go back and and reflect his heart and his grace and, 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 and his life in our fathers, fathers in all of us. So that's why the greatest story in the Bible about fathers is in Luke chapter 15. But if you see in the 10 verses that I read, about nine times the word father is used. 10 verses, nine times the word father. Oftentimes people say the story is about a prodigal son. But I would call it, the story is about a gracious and loving father. So th through this story, I want you to see five qualities that we see in our spiritual godly father. Okay, so quickly without wasting time. Okay, this story about two sons, is come, this story is about a 
wonderful Christian family. They loved Lord. I believe his father and his parents thought the word every day in this home. They had a time of prayer. And it says, and one day the younger son decided, you know what, I want to ask my dad of my share and I want to enjoy the money with the world. Imagine, imagine this. Is it rightful for him to ask? Of course he's rightful to ask. But it's also not a good thing to ask. As per Jewish law, the elder son gets the double the portion in Deuteronomy chapter 21, 17. But it's not a right thing for the younger son to say, you know what, father, give me the money I want to go and enjoy. It's like telling him, telling the father, you know what, I mean, I consider you dead. And I, I, I want all that you have. And I, I just wanted to take, take it from you and enjoy my life. So in verse it says, and the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. Let's listen, the first quality of a spiritual father, I would say here is, his father didn't, the verses doesn't say what happened, but this clearly says the father didn't have any question about his, his son's choice. He gave him a liberty to choose. Isn't that like our heavenly father? The one of the institutions that God gave in the beginning when God created man is the institution of free volition to choose what he wants to do. And we know what happened in the Garden of Eden. And, and, and the sin came into the earth and, and, and through that we all become sinners. But the, uh, the same quality we see in any spiritual father, the liberty that we give to our children in a sense. Liberty that doesn't take them out of the uh, Liberty in a sense, it says the child was grown. You can't ask a share when you're young. He's grown and he's asking his share when he's grown and his father gives him a liberty to choose. Oftentimes when our kids grow and they come to a certain level, oftentimes we say, you know what, I want you to become an engineer. I want you to become a doctor. I want you to do this and then I want you to become a pastor. No. We need to give liberty for them to choose as fathers. And we, we, we allow them to do what God gave us the same liberty when he gave us to choose. And I believe that's one of the wonderful qualities of a spiritual father to give a liberty to our children to choose what is right and what is wrong. So oftentimes they may, they may burn their hands and their fingers. That's okay. But Bible says in Proverbs 22, 17, it says, Teach a child in the way he should go. When he, when he leaves, he will not depart from it. Isn't that amazing? We teach in our homes the word of God is the priority in our life, in our homes. And we teach them the word of God. Even then they go to a far countries or wherever they go, which says the word will not depart from them. So when we have word in our homes, it's so easy to give liberty to our children. We could trust God because He is the keeper of our homes. He is the head of our homes. And He holds control in our homes. He is the head of our homes. So we could trust God and could give children our li the liberty that God gives us. Isn't that fascinating? The second point I would see quickly so. And if the story goes on, the younger son went back. He's gone to his friends. He spent all the money that he had with his friends. And finally his friends left. You know what, that's like the world today. They love you when you have it. When you don't have it, they look for somebody else. The love of this world is conditional. But the world, the love of the father is unconditional. And, and what happened in the story is everybody left him. And he says, now he goes, he, so verse 15, so he went and hired himself. Can you imagine? He is a son, now he hired himself. Remember his father had many servants under him. But now his own son has become a servant because of his decision. So he went and hired himself out in the citizens of the country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine and would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods and the swine. But I like this verse 17. It says, but when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's iron men have more than enough bread that I am dying here with hunger? I was just thinking in this verse as a second quality of, our, of our being a father. 
It's the love of a home. Remember, when the son was in the sin, he didn't thought I will go back to my friends. He didn't say I would, I would check somebody who could love me. But he knew all these years he found love in the house. He knew there's one people, there's one, the one person who would accept him no matter how he is, is his father. He had courage to come back to his father and trust him. He knew this gracious God, this gracious father is loving. He will accept me as I am. And he says, he got his senses all and he says, wow, I remember the love that I, I got it in my home. I'm going to go back. I am going to go back to my home where I would find love. I want to ask you this. Is our homes filled with love? Do our children love to be with us in our homes? Or are sometimes we are to be busy to even love our children? Like, like, this, like the world is like squeezing us into a small. But do we have time for our children? Do we, have, do we have time to pray for them? Trust God for them? So even if they go in the wrong steps, you know what? They would like back to come back. You know what? There's somebody who loves me back home. So I believe the second quality of a godly father is to reveal that love in the home. A godly love that our children would like to come back to. And not only that, the Bible says, the father not only just loved him, it says he prayed for his son. It says that he went every day, every day out of the village and he waited for his son that one day he would come back. I believe the third quality of his, of his father is that he is a praying father. He prayed for his son every day and he believed God that he would come back. Our homes be filled with prayer. Oftentimes we think, you know what? We could give our best education to our kids. You know what? That's all I, as a father's responsibility. No, not that. I, I don't think that is one. I am not against education. But you know what? That's not the priority. There's a word and prayer that becomes a priority in our homes. Somebody once, Dr. Ravi Zakaria met one woman. She's the greatest uh, educationist. And he asked her, what is one good advice that you give to the young boy who was in his prime years? And she answered, I would give him the best education that I could give. Then Ravi Zakaria said, you know what, I heard of a story, ma'am. It's, it's told by D.L. Moody. And he said, if a boy is robbing bolts and nuts on a railway track, and if you give him the best education, very soon he'll grow up and we'll start robbing the tracks and the trains. <laughs> That's what the world education could be. But thank God we have the word. We could educate our children in the word of God. I told my son when you are in 8th standard, ninth standard, go to Bible school. Go for one year of Bible school. Let, let you, after Bible school, you choose what you want to do. I'm not going to hold you. Because these are the convictions that we give to our children and we, you know what, they just watch us. They are just, we are just like the mirrors for them. They do exactly what we do. So yeah, is my home is filled with love and prayer. Are we teaching our children to trust God? These are very amazing qualities. Fourthly, it's in verse 20, I close soon. So he got up and came to his father, but he was still a long way off. His father saw him and felt, felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The fourth quality of a father I see in this passage is he was compassionate and gracious. He didn't say, oh son, I told you you shouldn't have gone there. My baat sunta to to achcha rehta na. No, he didn't do all that. He just loved him. He had compassion and love. You know what I want to ask you tonight? You know, how, do our homes, when children do mistakes, by the way, do we show them grace and compassion? The heart of God towards them. And in the story we see the father is compassionate. 
He kissed them. He hugged them. I believe, I believe the son had a whole list you know, of paper and he wants to say, Father, this is the things I did. I want to ask forgiveness from you. But I believe, you know what? His father just threw that paper down, shut his mouth and he said, you know what? I just love you as you are. I just love you. My love doesn't stop you. By the way, grace didn't give you, grace was not given to us when we are weak, when we fail. Grace was given at when we are, when we are sinners. Oftentimes people say, you know what, I failed and God gave me grace. No, he just gave you grace. By the way, God will never look upon sin. He doesn't have the memory of our sin, by the way. Oftentimes we could keep in the guilt trip, you know what, I fell. God knows, God will punish. No, God doesn't remember. He doesn't look upon sin. He's a gracious God. So he's a compassionate God. And Bible says, and the father was compassionate and loved him. Kissed him, and finally, it says, in, uh, and finally it says, uh, but the father said to his slaves, quickly bring him the best robe and put it on him. Imagine, I believe the son came with the torn clothes. The first thing the father said, cover him up, cover him up with a robe, cover him with God's righteousness. Let nobody accuse him. Let nobody raise fingers like Zechariah chapter three, like the Satan accuses us daily, but the. But the father said, cover him up with a robe, cover him with God's righteousness and his mercy that nobody could accuse him and raise a finger because he's perfect, because I called him perfect and he is so. That's amazing. So uh, do we cover our children's sin in a sense, not publicly? We don't, we don't uh, like talk about our children's mistakes so much outside the world. We know they fall, but we encourage them, we cover them. You know what? A, 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 a spiritual father covers a multitude of sins. That's grace. And and closing and, and closing, it says he celebrated his return to return and had a feast. That's beautiful. You know, it's a place of feast. My home should be a place of feast, joy, rejoicing. In closing, we see the five characteristics of father. As father, we too have a heavenly father. And we see the same qualities that he revealed to us. Like he gave us a free volition. Remember, the day we became believers, today we have a choice to choose what is right and what is wrong. Today people go to hell not because, not because, not because Christ didn't die for them. They went by their own choice. Christ is paid for the whole world. And our Christ gave us the free choice. Secondly, he gave us not a normal love that we go to our children, that we give to our children, but he gave us an unconditional love. He left heavens and he died for us. This love cannot be seen anywhere else, but only in Christ. Thirdly, he, he was compassionate, understood our weaknesses. He was a compassionate God. He remember he touched the leper. He, 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 he showed compassion to the people. He healed the blind. He's a compassionate God. And we, are, we also see him. He's a praying father. He's interceding for us in heaven, for you and me. That's beautiful. That's the joy we have. Nobody is praying for me, but there's a, Jesus is praying for me. That's the joy that we have as a Christian. And also, he covers us with his own righteousness. Our righteousness is like a filthy rags. But God's righteousness covers us and He makes us clean, pure as white as snow. That's beautiful. And He celebrates when one lost sinner comes back to. There's a feast that every time happens in heaven is when one soul comes back to Christ. That's the joy of that's the joy of knowing this Father, the Father that we could live. We cannot be perfect fathers, but we have a Father who lived perfect. That is Jesus. Looking unto him, we could be perfected. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, we all, we all, all pray. If I ask to pray, some people will pray. And then they pray, send, send their prayers, form our prayers. For me, when you pray, there is two things. Number one, your prayer should be intimate. Intimate. 
I remember to all only to teach you how to pray led by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So a simple message. A message as enough for new believers, but also enough for my job believers. Amen. really learn how to pray. As Christians, we must realize that nothing lies beyond the reach of prayer except that which lies outside the will of God. Prayer can do anything that God can do, and God can do anything. There is no need in your life that proper prayer could not supply that need. I think everybody agrees with that. We are, we are all seeing hundreds of prayers being answered. Hundreds well, for college, admissions, jobs, people, family, I say people, church, ministries, hundreds of prayers. Within the scriptures, the Lord gives us many promises regarding His faithfulness to answer prayer. In the Old Testament, in Jeremiah 33, 2 and 3, the Lord says, Thus says the Lord, who made the earth and formed it, The Lord Yahweh is my name. Call unto me, and I will answer you, and reveal to you great and mighty things which you do not know. God says that I will reveal to you great and mighty things which you do not know. The above is such an interesting phrase, isn't it? What does God want? What does God mean by saying, I will call to me in prayer, and I will show you great and mighty things which you don't know? It sounds so confusing. I'll show you mighty things which we don't know. No know what what in the Hebrew is very meaningful. In the Hebrew it literally means things that are hidden, things that are fenced in, things which seem inaccessible. Listen, are there things in your life that seem inaccessible and impossible for you to solve in your family or church or business? Are there things hidden and fenced in that you can't figure out in your relationships? God says to you and me, call unto me for help in prayer and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that I will do. In other words, Prayer will knock down walls of difficulties that seem inaccessible to us in our natural strength. Jesus said in the New Testament in Matthew 7, 11, If you earthly fathers who are not perfect know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give what is good to those who ask him? Again in James 4, verse 4 we read, you have not because you ask not. Of course, this don't have that as an epitome on who you give. You have not because you ask not. I don't, I don't want that said with me. Amen. You are going to say you have not because you have not. In Matthew 7 verse 7, Jesus says, Ask and keep on asking, and it will be given you. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking reverently, and the door will be opened to you. Lord, teach us to pray. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, 
teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, When you pray in this manner, therefore pray, Father, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The disciples had seen Jesus pray on many occasions. Sometimes they would wake in the middle of the night to find him absent from the weary band of men huddled around the campfire. He would be off somewhere by himself praying. Occasionally in the quiet of the morning or night, they could overhear him praying. His prayers were not like the Jewish religious leaders of that day, who normally read their prayers from a book and prayed with a great degree of formality. Neither were they like ecstatic babblings and repetitious chanting they heard coming from the pagan temples. Jesus' prayers had the familiar warmth and intimacy of a son speaking to his father. The disciples longed to have this type of intimacy with God, but they didn't know how to attain it. So they came to him with this request, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus answered his disciples by giving them what today is commonly called the Lord's Prayer. Actually, this prayer should be called the Disciples' Prayer. Prayers that Jesus actually prayed are recorded elsewhere. This one he gave us, his disciples, to guide us in the manner in which we should pray. I'd like to make an important point regarding this prayer. Firstly, notice that Jesus did not tell his disciples to pray this prayer. He simply said, in this manner, therefore pray. This is not a prayer to be repeatedly, repeated mindlessly as a ritual. In many traditional churches, a pastor or priest will say, now let us stand and say the Lord's Prayer. They have made a repetitious ritual of the Lord's Prayer. This is not really what Jesus meant for us to do when he gave us this prayer. He himself once taught, and when you pray, do not use meaningless repetitions as the heathen do. Jesus himself would not have wanted us as is done in so many church worship services, to make a ritual of this prayer. I personally believe that Jesus gave us this prayer as a good guide as to what should be the outline and content of our prayers. He said, when you pray, therefore pray in this manner. that Jesus gave you to remember as you pray. Jesus wants you to Point 1. Fix your heart on the personal presence of God. Jesus started his teaching by saying, This is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. The first thing that Jesus wants you to do as you start praying is to recognize the personal presence of God, your Father. Who are the persons involved in prayer? A child and his father. It is important for you as you enter into prayer to recognize that you're coming to God and speaking to God as your father. It is important to understand this because real powerful prayer, prayer that gets answers is, from the ch is for the child of God. 
you might say that this is to be taken for granted because everybody is a child of God. No, they are not. Not everyone is a child of God. Jesus said to the unsaved Pharisees, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. Who then are the children of God? The Bible says in the first chapter of John concerning the Lord Jesus, but as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So, not everybody is a child of God. Only true believers in Jesus can be called children of God. Some may argue that since God created all human beings, that he is the father of all of them. Well, God also created rats and snakes and vultures and grasshoppers. He is not their father. No, he does not become father by creation. He becomes father by the new birth. God becomes our father when we are born again into the family of God. The first thing that must occur if you want your prayers to be answered and you want your prayers to be powerful is to become a child of God. In order to be a child of God, you must receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Have you done that? Does Christ by the Holy Spirit live in your heart? If so, then you are ready to enter into the meaningful, intimate prayer. <coughs> when you are truly a believer in Christ and can address God as Father, you will see how easy it is to pray. It will become easy for you to pray because the Holy Spirit of God, who has come to live in your heart, will give you a new intimacy with God and you will recognize him as your heavenly father. The Bible says, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Here's how another translation renders this verse. You can tell for sure that God has fully adopted you as his own children because God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying out, Abba, Aramic, Papa, Father. Doesn't that privilege of intimate conversation with God make it plain that you are not a slave but a child? And if you are a child, you are also an heir with complete access to the inheritance. After you are saved and born into the family of God, God's Spirit gives us a longing to pray and to call out in intimacy to God. We intuitively recognize Him as our Abba Father. What one want every one of us and Mama when we are saved and Mama the weeks after you are saved suddenly my my prayer the life changed. Suddenly God became more than uh, my creator became my father. The word Abba is so used today in Israel. We go to Israel, we have no children saying Abba Abba wait for me. Abba, as a common term, which means charity. Uh, often, often, even much of believers don't focus on the who they're talking to. If someone says, pray, revise, I mean, say, Father, that's why the yeah, we have no intimacy. What is going to do with you? It's a, well, what am I thinking to pause thinking about it. My father is, well, is listening. A personal testimony of a seeker 
Bilgen Sheik, in her biography entitled, I Dared to Call Him Father, tells how she was born in a conservative Muslim family. Her husband had served as the Pakistan's Minister of the Interior. She was restless in her search for spiritual reality, as she, so she ordered her chauffeur, who was a Christian, to bring her a Bible. Occasionally, she read from both the Bible and the Quran side by side. She once confided to a Christian worker, I am confused about your faith. It seems to make God so personal. To which the lady replied, Why don't you talk to God as if he was your father? Bilkis Sheikh recalls going to her bedroom, getting down on her knees and trying to call God Father. At first she struggled and was afraid to, God, to call God his Father, thinking that it might be sinful to try to bring God down to her level. She felt she could not and dared not, so she gave up. However, later that night she got out of bed, got on her knees and called out Father. She relates what happened next. Suddenly, my room wasn't empty anymore. God was there. I could sense his presence. I could feel his hand laid gently on my head. He was so close that I found myself laying my head on his knees like a little girl sitting at her father's feet. For a long time, I knelt there sobbing quietly and floating in his love. I found myself talking with him, unapologizing for not having known him before. After a time, she reached to the bedside where she kept the Bible and the Quran. She lifted one book in each hand and said, I am confused, Father. Which one is your book? Suddenly, she heard a voice inside her that said to her as clearly as if she was repeating words from her own mind. In which book do you meet me as Father? She knew immediately she had her answer. She realized that the Bible was his book and it was in her own hands. When you pray, pray from your heart and focus your full attention on your Heavenly Father. If you have been born into the family of God, then you are a beloved child of your Father. As you enter into prayer, you can visualize yourself sitting at your Heavenly Father's feet or crawling up into his lap, putting your hands around his neck, and talking to him as you would with your own father. The mood is so simple, but it's so meaningful. If I can get you to be more intimate when you pray, if someone says to the real pray, don't just enter into prayer, say words, so pause and realize who you are speaking to. When you pray at home, imagine yourself talking face to face with God. Don't be Form, tell me, tell me, form. I understand the privilege you have to be intimate. It will change your prayer life. Anyone who can talk to an earthly father can talk to their heavenly father. You do not have to pray in a formal old King James Version English or eloquent poetic phrases in order to talk to God. You can just talk to God out of your heart. That's the way a child talks to his father. What would I think if my child had to greet me when I came home and said, Hail, respected father, welcome home from thy office. Will thou grant to your son some money that I may travel to the shopping center and procure for myself some school uniform to clothe myself? That would sound very formal and ridiculous. When I come home, my child is more likely to say, Dad, I'm so glad you're back. Dad, I have an urgent need. I really need a school uniform for tomorrow. 
could I please get some money? He would have spoken to me out of his heart because I am his father. So many of us have been raised up in tradition. We think that King James is inspired. Who uses by the today? Who uses was also all in this? If someone can, we didn't believe her. You and you're talking with thou the thy the same. <laughs> <laughs> even my even no one to this other thing. <laughs> and all you may have been talking. They talk as a father and a child. So, the intellectual talks to God with his son. When you say, Father, I understand the room lights up with his presence. Amen. Jesus said, when you begin to pray, Recognize who you are speaking to. Your Father who is in heaven, whose name is holy. So speak to him with reverence and with love as a child would speak from out of their heart. If we pray in this manner, recognizing that we are speaking to our own heavenly Father, we enter into meaningful and intimate prayer in the very presence of God. Secondly, Jesus told us to Focus your prayer on the priorities and promises of God. Next, Jesus said to pray in this manner, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In any kingdom. What did Jesus say? Pray for your will be done on this earth. As in heaven. Why? Isn't Why? Isn't God's will automatic? Ask yourself. Some people say God is sovereign, almighty, he controls everything. If that's so, then why do we need to pray? We will be done more. Because God's will is not automatic. Nor does God bless all men to be saved, but not all men are saved. They have to choose. God gives us on the earth to be His representatives. As you and I who make then heaven to prayer. One says, heaven is my home, but yet again to men. Psalm 115. Heaven is my home, but yet again to men. It's true now to our prayers which make us work heaven. In any kingdom, the king is the sole one in charge, while the full rule and authority of God's kingdom will be established only after Jesus returns in his second coming, God still desires today that through his church, his beloved people, the will of the king is established and the spiritual life of his kingdom is manifested. Prayer has only one purpose. And that is that God's will, as he desires it in heaven, shall be done on earth. Prayer is not trying to get man's will on earth done in heaven. Prayer is requesting that God's will in heaven is done on earth. Amen. Was, was, we have the Bible. 
and senses. All was all men became worshippers. All was our families are blessed. All was our children serve the Lord. All was never go to mission fields. All was the gospel is based every child, every village, every town. But it happens only as we enter into prayer. One works within apart from prayer. That's why God gave us prayer and says, pray this way. It will be done on it as heaven wants it. Amen. Scripture makes it father will not break his promise to his own child. A promise is a written or verbal declaration that binds the person who makes it to do or not to do a specific act. When God makes a promise, it is his pledge or understanding to do or refrain from doing a certain thing. Such promises form the basis for the believer to exercise faith while asking the Lord to supply what he needs. The validity and dependability of a promise rest on the character and resources of the one who makes it, just as the validity of a bank check depends on the integrity and bank balance of the one who signs it. The holy character and faithfulness of God makes his promises credible. The writer of Hebrews testified, he who promised is faithful. The kneeling King Solomon said, not one word has failed of all his good promise. Was a word in the form Solomon said, it looks at Israel history, it says, no, not one word of all, but almost as good. Awesome. <coughs> God's promises are bound up with his character and rest on four of his divine attributes to change or fluctuate. His truthfulness, which makes lying impossible. His omniscience, which makes his being deceived or mistaken impossible. His power, which makes everything possible. His unchangeableness, which makes it impossible for him to change or fluctuate. So when we come to God armed with one of his promises, we can do so with the utmost confidence. We can share Abraham's unstaggering trust in the promises of God, of whom it is said, with respect to the promise of God, Abraham did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. The wide range of God's promises. One of the astonishing features of the Bible is the wide range and variety of the promises it contains. The Apostle Peter calls them his precious and magnificent promises. Some diligent Bible student after careful study revealed that there are more than 8,000 such promises in God's word, which a believer can appropriate, lay hold of by faith. A large proportion of these promises can be appropriated through prayer. When reading scripture, we should be alert to discover what God has promised to do, and then we should lay hold of his promises. We, should, we shall discover promises for adversity and prosperity, Promises of peace, guidance, protection, strength, deliverance, joy, and hundreds of other blessings. It is by means of prayer that a believer can turn the promises of God into reality in his or her own experience. Went home for orphans. It was only a 
through us and how God mentioned and came to when he gave us God and her fall sending everything God promises he does faithful. Amen. It is by means of prayer that a believer can turn the promises of God into reality in his or her own experience. That is why a Christian who desires to pray with fervency and power must know the promises of God which are in the Bible. How can we learn to pray according to God's will on any subject? Well, some things are plainly stated in the Word of God as God's will. For example, the Bible says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all may come to the knowledge of Him. Therefore, it is always God's will for us to pray for the lost to be saved, even in the remotest parts of the earth. God loves to answer such prayers. The Bible says that after a person gets saved, God desires that they learn to be His faithful disciples and live sanctified lives. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. The Bible tells us that it's God's will to have unity in His church. Ephesians 4, 3 and 4 exhausts, exhausts us to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. The Bible tells us that it is God's will for us to have a spirit of thanksgiving. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. While we know that certain things are the will of God, in other things we must seek His will by the Holy Spirit. That's why a believer needs to learn to be led by the Holy Spirit in his or her praying. We are going to pause here, okay? Because we will continue part two next week. But here's the main point. As you say, number one, God wants you to be intimate. Intimate. He says, don't draw to me as if you don't know me. I'm a father, I'm a heavenly dad. Come to me. Whenever you talk to me, put your arms on me. Speak face to face. I'm a father. And when you do, you will sense my presence. Often. Number two, when I will pray, everything as rose well, but can happen. Only fair and hazard is what as a God's will. And only fair which is not that is which is as a God's will. He says, everything, everything, anything, everything, whatever, ask, ask, him ask. But, how do you know God's will? Number one, according to the word and his promises. I should go as a believer here to know what's in the Bible. Find the boss in the in the Bible. And learn to pray according <coughs> to his boss. So Lord, he has what he promised. Now to as he promised. Amen. Lord, and Son of Lord, 
बहुत बहुत बहुत